Hey everyone, this is our lesson on DNA and replication. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain the double-stranded complementary nature of DNA as related to its function in the cell. So first, let's just make sure we know what DNA is, just as a quick review. We know that it's made up of chromosomes and it contains genes, which are the parts of DNA that code for certain traits that we possess. So chromosomes, remember, are made up of two halves called sister chromatids. So those are what make it look like, um, you know, your X shape with that centromere right there in the middle. So I want you, I'm going to go through here and get these little boxes to pop up. You need to label on the picture in your notes. I think that's everything. You need to pause this here um, and label these parts of um, your DNA, chromosomes, chromatids, all of that. Get these labeled so you have them for later reference. I'll get these two that I didn't want to go to. All right, so what is DNA? DNA is um, an abbreviation for deoxyribose nucleic acid. So <clears throat> when we're looking at DNA, it's really the blueprint of the cell. It's what um, encodes all the information that the cell needs to function properly. And it controls the characteristics that we exhibit. So DNA is a nucleic acid, which means it is made up of the monomer's nucleotides. If you remember that all the way back from unit two, um, where we have a sugar, phosphate groups, and some um, like a nitrogen base. So that's what we're looking at here. And our, the sugar now has a name, deoxyribose, which is how we get the deoxyribonucleic acid part of um, DNA. So this, as you can tell, uh, is boxed off here to show you one nucleotide, which is that simple sugar. So this is the um, deoxyribose. We've got the A here, which is one of our nitrogen bases. And then we've got that phosphate group. And the nitrogen bases are really what we're going to start paying attention to here when we talk about DNA. So we do have base pairing that occurs within the, let me go ahead and get all these up here, that occur within the DNA strands, which allow the two sides of DNA to attach to each other to make that double strand, complementary strand um, concept that was mentioned in the standard. So we have four nitrogen bases that we look at, thymine, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. You've already seen adenine before because that's what we use in ATP. Okay, so ATP, the only difference <coughs> between the nucleotide and um, ATP is the fact that ATP has two more phosphate groups. But we symbolize all of them by their beginning letters. So thymine is T, adenine is A, cytosine is C, and guanine is G. And they will partner with specific other um, nitrogen bases that they complement each other. So thymine and adenine go together, and then cytosine and guanine go together. And when these partner up, we can um, classify them as either a purine or a pyrimidine. And the ability of bases to form these complementary pairs is what, like I said, what allows it to be double-stranded. So before we go into um, more about these pairings, let's talk a little bit about the background of DNA. So first, uh, the first people we register when it comes to the history of DNA or the history of the discovery is are Hershey and Chase, which are from 1952, and they prove that DNA is genetic material that um, is encased, you know, in all the cells. And we also have Chargaff's rule, and he is the one who actually realized how the uh, bases pair together. So um, that T and A are equal to each other, they partner, and then G and C are equal to each other. 
the main two people that are credited when it comes to the structural idea of what we think DNA is are Watson and Crick. And they discovered the structure in 1953 and they called it a twisted ladder. So it's double stranded and it's got that double helix shape where it continues to twist around almost like a spiral staircase. And because of this, they actually won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1963. So that was um, just a quick show of what the DNA structure looks like. So now let's talk a little bit more about um, the parts of DNA structure. So remember A and G are called purines, which means they have a double ring base. And then C and T are pyrimidines, which means they have a single ring base. In DNA, the nucleotides will combine to form two long chains, and each chain contains a single nucleotide connected to each other. These chains are joined by what are called hydrogen bonds, which um, were mentioned way back when we also talked about the properties of water. This is really pulling in information from Unit 2. So if you struggled with Unit 2, you may want to go back and look over some of that information. The chains have a twisted ladder shape called that double helix, which you can then see, you know, over here on the um, slide itself. Oh. So here just shows you the difference between a purine and a pyrimidine. So purine, remember we said, is a double, um, basically, a, I don't want to say double sugar base. It's a double... How did I define this? Give me one second. I want to make sure I use the right term. Ring base. Okay, that's what I was thinking. I just didn't want to use the wrong one. So, oops. if you look here, we've got two rings on our purines here. One ring is this pento or pen, pentagon shape, and one is this hexagon shape. You see that down here on guanine as well, whereas in the pyrimidines, they only have one ring in their um, base that shows up on the nucleic acid. So nucleotide labeling, you remember all of these parts, so this is just a good quick little review. Make sure now, instead of just saying sugar, we call it a deoxyribose sugar. That's what makes DNA special. So on the backbone of DNA, we look at the strand of alternating your um, sugars, your deoxyribose sugars, and your phosphates. So the nitrogen bases are attached at the sugar with what's called a hydrogen bond. And they are going to be on the inside because they make in this strand of DNA, they make those little dots on the side. Those are the... Um, the connections between the nitrogen bases. But the sugars will alternate with the phosphates, as you can see here. Phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. They will alternate to bond together to form that backbone, the strands that you can see there on the side of your DNA. The rungs, or the parts in the middle, are where your base pairs are attracted to each other. So this is where your adenine and your thymine will partner up. This is where your cytosine and your guanine will partner up, which you can see in this picture here where they've got A's and T's together, and they've got like G's and C's together. So we know, based on what we learned last unit with cell division, that the DNA is replicated in the cell to allow for mitosis and meiosis to occur. Um, and this is a process called DNA replication. So when it replicates, adenine will always pair with thymine and guanine will always pair with cytosine. There is not going to be a change there. That means that the number of A is equal to the number of T and the number of G is equal to the number of C, which is what we refer to as Chargaff's rule. Because we know that thymine always pairs with guanine and cytosine always pairs with, I'm sorry, thymine always pairs with adenine and cytosine always pairs with guanine, we can predict the order of the bases on one strand 
if we know the other. So if we know half of a strand of DNA, we're going to be able to figure out the other knowing their partners. From each half of the original DNA template, a new complementary strand can be made um, because of those partnerships. And then the end result of DNA um, is two or of this replication are two strands of the DNA are now formed and they will be identical. So the steps of DNA replication. First, we have DNA heliocase, which is an enzyme. Remember, if you see that ACE ending, that tells you we're looking at an enzyme. It will break down the hydrogen bonds between the nitrogen bases of the two strands. So some people refer to heliocase as a zipper. It unzips the DNA because it breaks those hydrogen bonds between. And um, it allows for us to have two separate, like, parent strands that we can then use to make the complementary strand. So the, they will have loose nucleotides that will join up with their matching bases on both of the separate strands. When that happens, an enzyme called DNA polymerase will attach and proofread the loose nucleotides. So that's going to actually come back and rezip the DNA. So if a nucleotide has come in and it is lining up correctly with its partner and it's attaching the right way on the strand itself for the backbone, polymerase will come in and zip it back up. Because each strand has produced or was half of a parent strand, and half of a new strand, the DNA replication is said to be semi-conservative because it conserved half of the original strand that we used. So this is just a quick video to show you the whole process. So coming through here would be DNA heli or the heliocase, and then behind it, these little darker parts are going to be pulling in your new bases. Those are the polymerase. The end result of replication, again, is just two DNA strands formed. One half is the old strand and one half is the new strand. And then I just want you, you can pause right here and read over these recaps of the steps. Now, let's do some replication practice. You actually will need to pause the video in a second and you will do two complementary strands here for practice. So if we look at this for complementary strand, remember A will partner with T, so that's going to be our complement. We have a T next, so that's going to partner with A, A, T. Now we've got a G, remember that partners with C. Then we've got a C, so G, C, C, G. So now I want you to go through and um, do the next two examples. So again, replication is said to be semi-conservative. What does that mean? Remember, that means that half of the strand comes from the original DNA strand. Half is now the new strand, the new complement. All right, guys, so this um, hopefully...